Welcome everybody to week six, day one. No class on Monday, so this is uh, day one, even though it's a Wednesday. Uh, you need to go back a few chapters. So the big news is we're going to have a midterm on Friday. So it won't be in class. We're just going to have a regular lecture on Friday and a le regular lecture today, but I am going to go over the midterm a little bit for you. Basically, it's going to be on Canvas. You will have the entire weekend to do it. So the midterm starts at 11 a.m. on Friday, right after class is over. And it ends 10 a.m. on Monday. And by beginning and ending, that's the window in which you have to take it. Every year, students uh, forget to take it or they don't check in or whatever. Um, don't be that person. Um, don't wait to the last minute to take it. Uh, the, the deadline of 10 a.m. on Monday is actually a hard deadline. If you start at 9.50 in the morning, you'll have 10 minutes to do the midterm, okay? Like, it's a, it's a hard ending. Uh, one of my friends took one of my classes once, and he started the, the final, like, a minute before it was due, hoping to get the extra two hours, you know, of time, and it just went like that. So, uh, don't forget to take the midterm. Don't forget to take the final. <laughs> That's some of the best advice I can give you in college. And... Um, the way that it'll work is once you start the test, you have two hours from the moment you start it to finish it. Um, so don't don't like open it up and look at it and then close out and like I'll do it later. Now, once once you've opened it up and looked at it, stopwatch begins. You have two hours from that point to submit it. Okay, and uh, we will go over the topics of the midterm. So, uh, I have a little um, cheat sheet for you, put together, here we go. So, let me get my face out of the way. <clears throat> so, it'll be on Canvas, it'll be on the module section or the quizzes section, and it'll just be like your daily quiz. There won't be a daily quiz on, uh, there won't be a daily quiz on Friday, because I figured the, uh, the midterm is good enough, you know? Um, this is last year's notes, but it's the same, same principle. So it opens at 11 a.m. on Friday and it closes at 10 a.m. on Monday. Okay. And you have two hours once you start, uh, the midterm, I haven't, I haven't written it yet, but it'll be somewhere in the order of 20 to 30 questions, mostly multiple choice. Uh, there may be some matching, there may be some numeric responses or something like that. Maybe some true false. It just kind of depends on my mood at the time. The things you have to know are the five theories of truth. Um, be able to identify what is correspondence theory, what is coherence theory, consensus theory, pragmatic theory, Marxist theory, inflationary theory. Be able to, um, um, you know, take a quote. Like if I say, um, you know, it doesn't really matter why gravity is real. All that matters is that it is real and that it works and we can do useful stuff with it. That would be an example of a pragmatic theory of truth. Like, you know, basically what matters is what, um, you know, if it's useful, right? That's one way of doing it. Do you have a study guide? Yeah, this is the study guide right here. I'll, I'll post the link for you on it. Um, <clears throat> the uh, yeah, I would I would review all the theories of truth. I typically do a lot of those on the on the midterms. Um, truth tables. Um, some people are still, I think, kind of weak on truth tables. So um, we can run through. Maybe, some examples of doing, tr of doing truth tables if you want in a little bit. But um, for those, I do fill in multiple blanks. And so what it, what it looks like is it looks like a little truth table with blanks on it. And you fill in the fill in the missing entries for the truth tables. Um, make sure you know and and or and not how those work. Um, if you understand those concepts, it makes you a better programmer when you when you do programming. Um, uh, implications, logical implications, if x then y means that if x is true then y must be true for the implication to be to be true. Okay. So um, it, it's oftentimes very helpful to think of implications in terms of like when somebody lies to you, right? So it's a truth unless somebody is like lying to you. Um, so if I say that uh, you know if you don't clean your room I'll throw your cell phone away and you don't clean your room, and I, I don't throw yourself in a way I lied to you, right? So the only time the only time that X implies Y 
is false is if x happens and then y doesn't happen. Okay. Uh, if x is not true, then it doesn't matter. I didn't say anything about what would happen if x is not true. So if I say, uh, if you give me a chocolate bar, then I will give you an orange. If you don't give me a chocolate bar, I haven't said anything about what I would do, right? Yeah. Maybe I'll give you an orange anyway, I don't know. Uh, the study guide will be posted, yes. Is it like multiple choice or more of writing? It's, it's going to be mostly multiple choice uh, with some matching, some true false, that kind of stuff. Um, so if you need to review the Zybooks for implications, it's probably a good idea. It's something that you really want to kind of understand, just, you know, especially if you're going to be a programmer, but even just in life in general, like understanding if then statements is kind of, kind of important. Will, will there be a time limit? Yes, there's a two hour time limit. Um, uh, the There's a window of time that opens at 11 a.m. on Friday and it closes at 10 a.m. on Monday. Within that window of time, once you start, you have two hours to, to do it. Please do not forget to take the midterm. It breaks my heart every time. <laughs> like every semester, there's like two or three students that are like, uh, I forgot. And that's just a letter grade off the top, you know, if you forget. Is the midterm open note? Yeah, it is uh, it is open notes, open Zybooks, open uh, Google searching, uh, open my lectures. Um, the only thing that uh, is not allowed is talking to other people. Like you have to, you have to do it on your own. Don't obviously post questions or answers, <laughs> even worse, on um, Discord or, or to your friends and things like that. So, are you allowed to pause the exam? No. Once once you begin the exam, it is the, the clock has started. You have two hours. And two hours should be more than enough to, um, to do it. Um, it's, uh, I, I basically take how long um, I think it should take and I multiply it by four. I, I, normally I multiply by two, but um, there are people that have uh, accommodations, like uh, some people have like DSPS accommodations. They get double the, the testing time, so I just multiply by four, <laughs> you know, just so that, you know, it's not it's not supposed to be a time contest. It's mostly just so that you can't sit there and just watch every video, you know, like prep for the test before before taking it. Okay. It's still Monday, yes, but don't wait to the last minute. I would do it by like Sunday. Okay. There's always students like wait till Monday and they sleep in or they start at 9 a.m. and not realize that it's a hard deadline at 10 a.m. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so the five theories of truth, uh, you might notice there's six on there, because one of them I don't consider to be real. Uh, make sure you understand those, make sure you understand logic. A uh, lot, 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 maybe not a lot, but like a lot, at least one of each of these, of modus ponens, modus tollens, uh, affirming the consequent, denying the antecedent, be able to recognize those um, those four forms. Two of them are valid, two of them are invalid. Okay. So for example, if I say, if it rains, I will bring an umbrella. And it rains, then you can deduce, I brought an umbrella. That is modus ponens, right? If I give you the statement, if x, then y, if it rains, I bring my umbrella to school. It, it rained, therefore I brought my umbrella to school. That's modus ponens, it's a valid deductive form of argument. Um, modus tollens is if you see me at school and I don't have my umbrella, then you can deduce that it's not raining. Because if it did rain, I would absolutely have my umbrella, and I don't, so it's not raining. Okay. These are the two valid forms of argumentation. And people get these confused with affirming the consequent and denying the antecedent. If these still confuse you, uh, ask questions, uh, review, Google them, you know, make sure you get those like engraved into your brain with like a laser cutter because um, like I said, it, it makes you a better programmer, but also just in life in general, uh, you will see people use these fallacies all of the time. And uh, you know, critical thinking is a GE. It's a, it's a required, like every person who goes to Fresno State must take a critical thinking class for this reason, because it makes you a better citizen. It makes you a better, less gullible, person in the world when people try to manipulate you with fallacies and things like that. So it's uh, it's good for your life as well to really understand these these four things here. So affirming the consequent would be, oh, you saw me with an umbrella at school, therefore it's raining. Not necessarily true. 
there's a lot of reasons why I might bring an umbrella to school. I might be doing a cosplay, right? So perhaps when I do cosplay, I cosplay as, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Resident Evil. Uh, uh, really? They just have random umbrellas, but nobody... Okay, there we go. I don't know. Yoshi with an umbrella. I don't know. That's, that's my cosplay outfit. I'm Yoshi with an umbrella. So, if you see me with an umbrella, it might not be because it's raining. It might be because I'm cosplaying at the time, right? So, for affirming the consequent, if I say, if it rains, I'll bring an umbrella to school, and you're like, oh, I see you with an umbrella, it must be raining. Wrong. Wrong. Very common mistake people make. I, there are other reasons I could bring an umbrella to school. It might be because it's sunny. It might be too sunny. And so I'm bringing an umbrella to keep the sun off me, to preserve my beautiful, you know, skin, right, from, from being sunburned. Because it looks like I'm kind of permanently sunburned, huh? <laughs> it's the Nordic ancestry or something like that. My my uh, my family just did a genetic test, and I have like 10% Scandinavian apparently. So, uh, yeah. So I might I might be trying to keep the sun off. So if you see me with an umbrella, that does not allow you to conclude that it's raining. And then denying the antecedent. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, if I if I say if it rains I bring an umbrella to school, and then I tell you it's not raining. Then you, if you say well you must not bring your umbrella that's a fallacy because again there's other reasons why I could bring an umbrella to school. Bring an umbrella to whack people with yeah I actually have a a, a, a umbrella that looks like a katana you know if you carry it over your shoulder and it looks like a sword you know you pull it out and it's it's an umbrella. And uh, my wife was uh, my wife was carrying that around the mall and uh, got in trouble. So, <clears throat> with her umbrella, <laughs> they thought it was a gun. That was the worst part. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like they're like there's a woman running around with a sword. It was like, I think she's got a gun on her back. It's like it's a katana. Like, what? Okay. <sighs> All right. So, uh. Do, 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 do. Uh, another example would be, you know, if I take a shower, I will become clean, right? So everyone online right now, I'm going to give you an argument. So if X, then Y. If I take a shower, then I will be clean, okay? So tell me if the following argument is valid or invalid. If I take a shower, I will become clean. All right. Premise one. Premise two. I did not take a shower today. Conclusion. I am clean. Valid or invalid? Is there going to be a grading curve? No. If I take a shower, I will become clean. I did not take a shower, therefore I am clean. If I take a shower, I will become clean. I did not take a shower, therefore I am clean. No, it's completely invalid. <laughs> um, okay, another one. Um, if I take a shower, I'll become clean. I am clean, therefore I took a shower. Premise one, if I take a shower, I'll become clean. Premise two, I am clean. Conclusion, I took a shower. Also invalid. So this is, uh, this is called affirming the consequent. If I take a shower, then I will become clean. I'm clean, therefore I took a shower. This is a fallacy. Okay. So it seems like uh, uh, maybe, maybe I'll do another quiz on this uh, today, just to give you more practice on it. All right, one more. Uh, if I take a shower, then I will be clean. I'm not clean, therefore I did not take a shower. Valid or invalid? If I take a shower, then I will be clean. I am not clean. Therefore, I did not take a shower. This one is valid. This is modus tollens. Yep. If I take a shower, then I will be clean. I am not clean. Therefore, I did not take a shower. Valid. 
Okay. Um, so on top of that, then you've got valid, invalid, and sound. So the first thing you have to do is look at the form of the argument and see if it's a valid form. Okay. These are different forms. Some are valid, some are invalid. If it's a valid form, you proceed on to question two. If it's invalid, you just write invalid and stop. Yeah. So uh, question two, are the premises true? So uh, in general on this, I don't, I don't go into like hair splitting kinds of things. Like if I say that um, uh, guitars play music or something like that, like it's true, right? Like, you know, it's not, you know, like, well, I have a guitar that's a box that looks like, it, like in general, like I, I don't want you really second guessing the, the premises, you know, like, you know, cats or mammals, like it's true, right? Like, just, <laughs> just let it go. I, I understand that you could draw a picture of a cat and be like, look, this is not a mammal. And it's like, I'm not. When, when you're trying to determine if premises are true, you know, like just go with your kind of common sense. Okay. Second guessing everything. Yeah. I mean, I've got a, I've got a electric guitar here and uh, I most certainly can't play music on it. So, uh, yeah. but nonetheless, the, the point is like, if I were to make a premise, you know, guitars play music, like it, just, just go with it. Okay. So, um, so we have sound argument is one that is valid and both of the premises are true. So you have three categorizations for an argument. The worst is invalid, next best is valid, and the best is sound, valid and sound. Okay. Invalid, the form doesn't work, it's worthless. For valid, the form is correct, but the one or more of the premises are false. And then for sound, the form is valid and both premises are true. So, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, I'm probably going to put a couple simple questions on Scratch. I've been enjoying looking at your Scratch projects. That's been pretty fun. Um, yeah, maybe maybe just something really simple like what's the color of the flag you click on to play it, or <laughs> you know something like that. Like uh, we're we're going to do more Scratch after the <clears throat> after the midterm. Um, but uh, I hope you all are having fun with that. That is not a simple question. Yeah. Uh, I hope you're all having fun with Scratch. It's it's kind of a fun, kind of a fun little thing. Um, the people play the music. That's fair. It's very hard for colorblind people. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, something something like pretty, pretty low key on Scratch. I just want to make sure that you've had at least a little bit of familiarity with it. Uh, it, it's a it's it's kind of a fun little language like you know you can actually make kind of interesting you know programs you know that uh, would actually be kind of hard to do in C++ um, there's a lot of things you can do in C++ you can't do in scratch very easily but um yeah, it's kind of kind of fun to kind of get that feel for being a programmer and stuff okay um, um yeah so that's about it for scratch it just you know whatever you know Whatever you did already for Scratch is enough knowledge on that. I don't think it's really worth prepping for. If you haven't done it, then make sure make sure you're done the Scratch assignment. Okay. So ethical theories. So I've been I've been reading over your essays for um, Scott's lecture. I had them all graded as of like midnight last night, and now there's 50 more. <laughs> so I mean, like, all right, you know. No, no better time than the last minute, right, to get something done. But scratch is due on Friday, yeah. But um, the midterm will have one or two simple questions on scratch on it. So just make sure that you've done the scratch assignment first before taking the midterm. It should, it's not worth studying. Okay, right, so the ethical theories. And uh, so like I said, I, was, I read through, I, like I actually read them. I didn't just like go check. Like I actually read every essay. Uh, as of midnight last night and graded them and if you got marked down on it it's because um, usually I usually I marked it down because somebody demonstrated that they didn't understand the ethical theories right so like the first bullet point was explain to me the ethical theory that you're using in your essay because I, I just kind of want to see if like 
you can wrap your brain around it, you know? And um, so, for example, one person said deontology is the question of what is right and wrong. It's like, no, nah, not really. Like, <laughs> ethics is the question of what's right and wrong. You know what I mean? Like, that's what ethics is about. Deontology is about your duty towards right and wrong. Or uh, if you wanted to talk about the Kantian categorical, categorical imperative, acting in such a way that your actions could be universal, right? Um, or uh, treating people as a ends, not a means, and, and things like that. There's a lot of different ways you can phrase it. But, um, you know, if you, like another person said, deontology is the question of if the outcomes of your actions are like, mm, nope, <laughs> nope, nope. Consequentialism is concerns itself with the outcomes of your actions. Deontology is about your obligations, your duties, and your intentions towards doing something. So it's about the lead into the action, not the outcome of the action. It's the intention versus the outcome. And so some things are, are ethical under deontology. You're trying to help somebody. And unethical under consequentialism. You hurt somebody, right? And that's a terrible feeling um, when, when that happens. Um, you know, we try to avoid it, but like, you know, whether or not that action is right or wrong, you know, depends on whether you're a deontologist or a consequentialist, right? So, uh, sorry, I'm one of the 50. What, what do you mean by, oh, oh yeah, yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll get them all graded anyway. Um, yeah, so, uh, some of the, some of the easier ones to understand would be like divine command theory, right? Like one person said, uh, on the, uh, you know, the question of housing and homelessness in San Francisco, tech it, you know, all that stuff, um, was they said, I'm going to be using divine command theory. Divine command theory says we, sh we should basically follow, uh, in this case, I think they were uh, Christian. Um, apologies if you're not, by the way. Um, but I think you were. Um, they said uh, we should follow God's words and on helping people. I'm like, all right, that's divine command theory. And then, like, they quoted a verse from Ezekiel or something, you know, and, and then they said, you know, based on this Bible verse, we should build housing for the homeless. Boom. Perfect. Ten, ten out of ten. Right? That's divine command theory. And it's a very popular and kind of kind of easy to understand ethical theory, right? It's like, you know, you're, you're like, um, like I have some friends that are Sikh, right? And um, Sikh are really big on feeding people. I don't know if you... If you know this, but like the Sikh student union on campus, I, I don't know if it's still around in the in these COVID times, but like they would um, they would have like um, these events every week where they would just feed people, like just show up and here's food and stuff like that. And so, um, is this just review day? For, uh, we will still have a quiz today. You'll you'll still have a quiz today. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna get through this and we'll we'll go over a, a new topic too. So. Uh, so divine command theory, pretty easy to understand. Uh, the trouble with it is. Um, you know, what happens if somebody's not your religion, right? Then you can, you have kind of no means of resolving the disagreement, right? So, uh, ethical hedonism is a form of utilitarianism, and utilitarianism is a form of consequentialism. So there's all these schools of thought, and I'm, I'm just kind of giving you the 30-second um, nutshell version of them. Like, go take a philosophy class on ethics. It is really interesting. And, uh, or, or maybe it's not, I don't know. <laughs> it depends on really depends on the professor how, how interesting these things are. So, um, yeah, so ethical hedonism is basically the most pleasure for the most people. M maximizing pleasure for the most number of people, minimizing pain for the most number of people. So, um, pleasure doesn't just mean like, you know, you're shooting a heroin, you're like, ah, you know. Pleasure means, you know, physical health, um, satisfaction with your life, um, you know, like all those kinds of good, positive, you know, feelings. And pain isn't just like, you know, physical pain, like getting punched in the face, but also like, you know, ex being excluded from a social group and, you know, being uh, Twitter lynch mobbed or something like that. You know what I mean? So uh, basically, ethical hedonism, you just add up how much pleasure, subtract how much pain an action causes. And if it's positive, it's a moral action. If it's negative, it's an immoral action. So that's pretty pretty easy to understand right like that's you know you, you basically just look at look at an action did it cause more pleasure than pain all right it's moral yeah. downside to utilitarianism is there's always these sort of um, traps you can fall into like well why don't we just take the homeless people and cut them up for their organs you know because you can save the lives of 10 people by killing one person right so it's a moral good to you know 
do these horrific actions. And, and that's kind of, that's kind of like why my, my friend Scott, who, who gave the talk last week, he said, I'm sort of a, uh, pragmatic utilitarian. Like, you know, he's like, there, there are all these problems with it, but in general, like if you're just trying to like maximize goodness, you know, happiness for people, that seems in general to be a pretty good, you know, way of approaching things. And, and that he, he, he I didn't ask him to do that either. I don't think, uh, he just said, this is the ethical framework I'm using. And, you know, and, and then you can kind of understand where he's coming from because he's like, this is, you know, I'm, I'm not like an extreme utilitarian. It's just like, in general, I think it's good to try to maximize pleasure for people and minimize pain. And that's how he let off his talk, you know. Uh, it's in C culture. Yeah, the feed, to feed people. Yeah. Um, yeah, one of, my, one of my greatest regrets in college was um, we were having an end of the year party. And one of my fr um, uh, students, um, who's, I guess, kind of a friend now, yeah. Uh, he brought in like a giant like crock pot of like some sort of like um, I don't know what it was but it was like some sort of curry you know and I'm like playing a game and, and it just smelled so good I'm like oh man I can't wait for this game to be over so I can I can eat eat his food and and then when I get up and go over there not only was all the food gone but like people had literally cleaned the entire inside of the crock pot with bread there was not even a single like scrap of food left from uh, from his crock pot it was the this horrible, horrible tragedy. Um, okay, so uh, Kantian ethics is um, deontology. It's about duty. It's about your intention, not about the outcome. That's the big, you know, sort of difference between consequentialism and, and deontological ethics. Is it about your duty? Is it about your intention? Or is it about the outcome? So uh, Kant believes in the categorical imperative, which is that um, if everybody did them, the world would kind of be a good place, and evil actions are those that if everyone did it, the world would be kind of a horrible place. So just think about what if what if everybody did this thing? You know, what if everybody, you know, helped the poor? You know, would the world be a better place? Or you know, you know what I mean? So, um, and uh, you know, an another way that he puts it is treat people as ends, not means. So don't use people is a is a big thing for Kant as well. Uh, Peter Singer is a famous professor. I think he's at Harvard, I want to say. Yale, Harvard, Princeton, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's he's not a um, he's not a, a Kantian. I'm not sure why I have that there, but um, so I don't think he does. I don't think he does. I think he's a utilitarian. Uh, yeah, he's a utilitarian. Uh, but his, uh, oh, I know I have there. Um, yeah, so he's a utilitarian, but he believes that we should expand our concern, not just for people, but to animals as well. So um, he, he thinks that, you know, anybody can care about their family and their friends. And, and he says that as you morally develop, like you go from caring about just the people closest to you, your family, as you develop, you start caring about your friends, people outside of your family, and then as you develop more, you care about like your neighborhood, your, your neighbors, your city you live in, you know, you go out and you go to, with tree Fresno and plant trees. And um, he says, the higher your state of moral development, the more people you care about. And so uh, he thinks that it's not just a matter of, um, it's not just a matter of, you know, caring about people even, but like expanding it outwards to like, animals as well and so he's a he's a vegetarian things like that for that reason um i once asked him to give me a birthday present because i one, one of his one of his arguments is that like you shouldn't treat people differently just because they're close to you right like you know why, why would you why would you help somebody because they're your friend if you wouldn't help somebody if they're not your friend you know and so i asked him to buy me a birthday present and he didn't respond so I'm not, I'm not sure he, he puts his, his words in it. <laughs> like, why, why is it fair for you to buy birthday presents for your friend, Peter Singer, and you're not going to buy me a present? <laughs> so, uh, virtue ethics is about developing, um, cultivating virtues. virtues. Virtues lie in that golden mean between excesses. You can have too much of something, and that's bad. You can have too little of something, and that's bad. So Aristotle was all about finding, like, the proper moderate balance of all these different qualities and cultivating in your personality 
um, you know, kindness, right? If you have a lack of kindness, you're just a horrible person, right? It's horrible. If you have too much kindness, that's actually kind of bad too, right? Like imagine like you're a surgeon and somebody comes in and you like just start sobbing, you know, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this person was in a car accident and you, and you can't help them because you're just crying too much, right? That's, that would be an excess of kindness, you know what I mean? So, um, uh, you know, virtue ethics is, is focusing on that golden median between excesses and, um, and, cult and about personal cultivation. It's not really about having do's and don'ts, which some people really like having just lists of this is what you should do, this is what you should not do. And virtue ethics really isn't about that. It's about just trying to, um, you know, do actions in line with the virtues. And evil actions are those that uh, come about through vices, right? So, and then finally, uh, natural rights theory. All humans have inherent rights. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that kind of stuff. Um, there is um, a big divide between the left and the right, broadly speaking. The right typically believes in freedom from oppression, you know, freedom from the government. And the left, again, broadly speaking, believes in rights to things, like the right to work, the right to food, the right to healthcare, things like that. And that's one of the big philosophical uh, divides in our, in our culture and, and and if you think about it it's like okay well cool uh, you have a right to healthcare all right um, are you gonna compel somebody to work for you for free <laughs> you know like right like freedom from things don't require anyone to do anything it requires people to not do things right like the government not to censor you the government not to seize your property without a trial right if you have freedom to do things, like if you have a freedom to, if you have a right to a house, somebody has to build that house for you. And if you if you can compel other people to work for you and build a house, then you're taking away their natural rights to their own time and money and things like that. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, there's this philosophical divide. It's not about, you know, one side having the moral high ground. It's like, well, look, if you can compel somebody to work for you, they're not free, you know, so. Um, yeah, okay, so that's the ethical theories. Uh, we'll have a little bit on social issues in computer science. We haven't talked about piracy this year. We'll talk about autonomous vehicles now. Uh, what we talked about last week was uh, the housing crisis. And so we'll probably have something on the housing crisis in there. A few people, um, a few people, um, I think didn't really listen too closely to Scott's, um, analysis of the problem like like they're thinking that the the problem is uh due to um i don't know greed or something like that and and you know it, you know he, I, I think he was pretty clear on on some of the things that are not not the problem and so reading over your essays like some people just i think got that wrong i didn't mark you down because this is a critical thinking class and when i ask you what your opinion is on it if you say, you know, I think it's because of greedy landlords, it's like, okay, that's your opinion. I'm not marking you down. This is, this is not a class where I mark people down for disagreeing with me. And I put my money where my mouth is. I don't mark you down for disagreeing with me. But if I ask on the midterm, what did Scott say about the housing crisis, then, uh, I, you know, you, you, you can get it wrong. So, um, in short, supply and demand, right? Supply and demand is like the laws of gravity, right? You increase supply, price goes down. You increase demand, price goes up, right? You you decrease supply, price goes up. You increase supply, price goes down. Like it's it's just you know it's just one of those things, and that you just like you can yell at the sky if you want, but it's like a law of nature. And so um, to to summarize Scott's point is like he's like we just need to build more housing. Like we have a extreme housing shortage in California, and we need to build more housing. And his his personal his personal like quest is to build high density housing on rail lines, right? So you have a Caltrain station, you have a you have a mass transit center, and currently there's like single family home, homes surrounding it. He wants to take those out, put in big tall apartment complexes all around the the transit hubs, and then people can walk out of their house, get on the Caltrain, take it over to work, right? And uh, that's to summarize an hour and a half talk. That's his solution to the housing crisis. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about 
is something new. We've got 14 minutes left in class. You guys ready for this? Any questions about the midterm before we move on? Have I lost everybody? Nope. All right. It's not designed to be hard. If you've been awake and paying attention in this class, you should be fine. Um, some people do have trouble recognizing the, the four forms of argumentation, truth tables, things like that. Just run through those. All right. So uh, we're going to be talking about autonomous vehicles. I had a very interesting uh, uh, plane ride uh, probably five or six years ago at this point where I was flying into San Diego and the guy next to me was studying a, a paper on autonomous vehicles. So I started talking to him because I'm interested in that kind of stuff. And he was going to a insurance industry event on autonomous vehicles because the big question is, what kind of insurance do you need for an autonomous vehicle? All right? Because when you're driving a car and you hit somebody, it's your fault. But if your car is driving itself, is that product liability instead? Or is it still the driver's fault? And so they were having a conference to discuss like how it should be insured. Should it be insured under like auto insurance rules or should it be insured under product liability rules, right? So I don't know what the answer is to it either, but it was a, it was a fun, it was a fun uh, conversation. So the, um, uh, the moral machine project is, uh, Welcome to the moral machine. Okay. So there's a big question with autonomous vehicles. And the question is like, if you're forced into a situation where you have to run somebody over, who do you run over? And so the Moral Machine Project is basically um, a sort of a online um, uh, scenario. And uh, you have to pick, you're forced into two scenarios. You can't not pick one of them. You have to pick one of them. And so you have a self-driving car. Self-driving car is uh, head, heading down the street and it suddenly determines that there is a obstacle in the road in front of it. It can choose to either drive into that obstacle Killing the people on board, which is a, uh, a kid and a mom or something like that, uh, a female executive and a boy, they'll uh, you either drive into the barrier and die or swerve into the opposing traffic and run over two dogs. The dogs are abiding the law. They did have a cross symbol. I don't know if dogs understand you know crossing symbols, but um, this is also opposing traffic, right? So... Uh, <laughs> Basically, the trolley problem. Yes, yeah, it's 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 a it's a website that hundreds of thousands of people have taken to uh, I don't know, but something like that it, it, to to actually try to resolve the trolley problem. If you are in a runaway car and it's going to run over somebody, who do you run over? And you know, you can use this if you're building autonomous vehicles to program your your cars, right? So it's kind of a it's kind of a big big deal. So. Uh, what do you think? Answer differs by culture. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. So let's all vote. So how many people want to kill the um, uh, people? How many people want to kill the dogs? And I, and I mean, like, you don't want to kill them, but vote. Do I click left or do I click right? Let's just put it that way. Le one or two? One or two? The dogs are smart enough for the crosswalk then kill the people. <laughs> People will solve overpopulation. Kill the humans. Dogs are better than children. <laughs> all right. We'll kill the people. All right. Um, all right. Scenario number two. You've got like a family of five. Uh, and you can either run over some um, pedestrians that are flouting the law. These uh, people are jaywalking, right? You've got a doctor, an athlete, and an executive. And you can either run them over or you can swerve the family of five into a barrier and imposing traffic and kill an executive, an athlete, a doctor, a boy, and a baby. How many people want one? How many people want two? Why can't they brake? The brakes have failed. Uh, you're in a self-driving car with sudden brake failure. And, um, and so the, the computer can do the calculations. It knows it's gonna hit one of these two things. Either the three people in scenario one or it'll kill the five passengers in the car in scenario two. 
GTA moment. Yeah. The doctor is smart enough. He should know better. Yeah. The athlete should have been faster, right? It's his fault. Okay. So now we've got uh, some class involved, right? Because, uh, you know, uh, social issues do involve questions of, like, gender and race and class, right? Those are complicating factors on, you know, kind of all, all these big questions, you know? So now we got homeless people, right? So we got two homeless people crossing the street. They're jaywalking. Do we run over the, uh, the homeless people or do we kill the passengers in the car? Um, what do you think? One or two? All right, one it is. So now we've got uh, a car that has nobody in it. It's just a self-driving car. And we can either run over a man and two doctors uh, that are uh, abiding the law, or we can run over two female doctors. <laughs> oh, I see. So we have a man and two male doctors, a female and two female doctors. Uh, the females are jaywalking. The men are abiding the law. One or two. So now gender is involved, right? Like, uh, is it better to kill men or is it better to kill women? Is one of the questions. Uh, is it better to stay in your lane or is it better to swerve is the second question. And uh, is it proper to run over people that are breaking the law or people that are abiding the law? It's the third question. So there's three different issues going on here. Uh, two, run over the jaywalkers. All right, you guys like Judge Dredd here, right? Okay. So now we've got obesity as a factor. So we've got a fat man and uh, who is jaywalking and we've got a regular sized man who is not. And uh, what do you think? Do we do we run over the jaywalker uh, or do we <laughs> fat on cushion? Yeah. It, it looks like the guiding principle for y'all is if somebody's jaywalking or not, right? Like if they're jaywalking, they took the lot, like they took their life into their own hand. All right, that's, that's an interesting, you know, decision to make. Now there's no crosswalk at all. They just made it harder for you. Okay, so now uh, there's no there's no light at all, right? So you have sun brake failure. You can either kill. Oh, we got age now involved, right? That's another that's another compounding factor in all these things. You got race, class, gender, uh, and now now age and animal. You know whether dogs or humans are worth more. Uh, so we've got over here a male doctor, an elderly woman, a dog, and two male athletes. Over here, we've got a male doctor, an elderly woman, and a dog. Many of the athletes for the Olympics, we do. Yeah, America did not do well this year. Yeah. Yeah, Sean White coming in fourth place. I didn't see that one coming. Number two, all right. Uh, just because, why, there's less people? It's three casualties instead of five? Like, this one is just... They're, they're basically the same, right? Except there's two extra athletes on this side. Yeah, okay. So that'd be like a utilitarian kind of view, right? Like you know, minimize minimize suffering as much as you can. Okay. So now we've got <laughs> exactly the same. So uh, elderly man and a man, elderly man and a man. The question is, do you stay in your lane to run people over or do you swerve into opposing traffic to run people over? Do you see how this this website works? Like it's it's trying to figure out what your moral intuition is about about this scenario. If you drift right, you, you get a both. Yeah, multi multi track drifting, right? Hit the e brake, spin sideways, take them both out. <laughs> um, has anyone here ever seen The Good Place? It's a I, I don't I don't watch TV, but I actually watched the entire series of The Good Place, which was it felt a bit weird for me. Um. Like, I, I actually don't remember the last time I actually watched a TV series. Like, um, and I watched every episode of that. And, and part of the reason for it is because they actually had really good philosophy in the show. And they were able to convey, like, these fairly complicated philosophical, like, concepts in, like, two sentences. Like, it, it seems like they're, like, lecturing on a topic for, like, a long time, but they're really not. Like, they actually pack it down into just, like, a couple sentences... And, and a couple lines of dialogue, which is really impressive to me. And they consulted with a, a professor at uh, UCLA. I think she, um, I think, would have conversations with the uh, the authors and things like that to make sure the uh, concepts were coming through properly and stuff like that. So uh, I think we got votes for one Stan Lane. Okay. 
Uh, so now we've got a man versus a jogger, um, Stan Lane killing, uh, killing the passenger or, um, swerving and killing somebody who is abiding the law. One or two. Yeah. And so anyhow, the, uh, the good place had a, a, a fantastic episode on the trolley problem, which is what, what this is here. And I'll, I'll probably play that for you in a little bit. Uh, number one. Okay. And then we've got, was it two female executives and a girl versus two male executives and a boy? They're at a crosswalk, one or two. So we got basically passengers versus pedestrians, females versus males. Looks like one. Interesting. Okay. Uh, <laughs> All right. So three cats and a dog are driving a car. And <laughs> do we kill the cats or do we kill the pregnant woman, the doctor, and the, the male athletes? All right, we'll kill them. <laughs> that's, why you don't let, that's why you don't let a pigeon drive the bus, right? Uh, okay, homeless person versus a female executive. What type of city do they live in where they put berries in their own? It just it represents some sort of obstacle that you can't, you know, can't avoid. Like it might be a broken down car or something. Uh, one, okay. And we'll do a few more. Uh, one or two, we've got a doctor, executive, and a boy. Woman, female doctor, and a large woman. They are breaking the law. Looks like... Breaking the law again. You guys are pretty... Justice oriented. Do we kill the um, old people that are breaking the law or the younger people who are following the law? One is the younger people following the law, two is the older people breaking the law. Goodbye bye, baby boomers. All right. All right. Um, so, aim of the studies to understand people's judgments about moral dilemmas that involve life and death situations. Uh, you get a sequence of scenarios. Um, the data goes to the Max Planck Institute for Human Development. And, um, so you can, you can see that for, for the class's responses here, it didn't seem like you really cared about the difference between athletic and fat people, whether or not some you're protecting a passenger or a pedestrian slight preference and eh, not really. Um, but you've met, you ca it cared a lot to you to, that people follow the law. Uh, you preferred younger people over older, I guess. Um, you wanted to stay in your lane as much as possible. No preference for animals. Um, I don't think we had any robbers in this one. And you cared a lot about preserving the most lives. So uh, you kill female executives the most. Congratulations, you're all horrible people. So uh, the trolley problem, if you don't if you don't know what this is, is a um, a famous uh, thought experiment in which uh, a trolley is running out of control. And uh, you're you're sitting there by a uh, by a switch, and so the trolley is running out of control. If you don't do anything, it'll run over five people. But if you flick if you flick the switch, then it will run over one person. So what do you do? Option one: Do you just stand back, don't intervene, and let the trolley run over five people, or do you flip the switch and have the trolley run over one person? What do you vote now? Option one: Five people. Option two: Flip the switch and kill one person. How will the car be able to recognize a doctor from the athlete? Well, doctors always walk around with a bag that have like the red cross on it or something. That <laughs> Flip the switch. What if the one was a doctor or something? But then will it count as you killing the person? <laughs> Legally, it will. You know, you make an argument that I was saving the lives of five people by killing one, but yeah, I, I probably wouldn't. I'd just be like, mm, no, I'm staying out of this one. So uh, that pentakill is free, yeah. Kilimanjaro. So the uh, um, yeah, there's a philosopher called uh, the Flip a Foot that came up with that one. Uh, there's another one, a very similar situation, which is about pushing. Let's see. And so, what about this scenario? There's a trolley running out of control. 
Flanders can either push the fat man onto the tracks, killing the fat man but preserving the family guy family, or you can do nothing. And uh, yeah, that's this is the classic one. So, <laughs> well, slightly. Yeah. So this is this is the classic problem, right? So option one, you shove the fat man onto the tracks to stop the trolley. Option two, you do nothing and let the five people get run over. Which one Which one do you prefer? Push the fat man. Yeah, the two-year-old solution of the trolley problem. Yeah, kill all of them, right? You push the fat man or do you um, let the five people get run over? Do nothing. A lot less people answering this one, huh? Not a lot of not a lot of people want to commit to uh, you know yeeting somebody off a bridge, right? Uh, and that's a very common response, actually. So so when people have run this experiment many times in different scenarios, and it's quite common for people to want to pull the lever to save you know lives, but for some reason, even though it's exactly the same problem, right? It's one life versus five. For some reason, when it comes to you actually pushing the person off a bridge. That makes the murder a lot more apparent, right? And and people have sort of this instinctual rejection to shoving somebody off a bridge, even though, you know, if you look at the moral calculus, it's the same, one life versus five lives. And so the same people who will throw the switch won't push the, the fat man in general. It's about, it's a pretty big swing between the two. And uh, the trolley problem, of course, has led to um, all sorts of... Uh, Memes, of course. There's trolley problem memes all over the place. Um, <laughs> there's nothing you do to save the people. However, if you pull the lever, then it plays All Star by Smash Mouth. If you pull to the right, it plays any random anime song. You can only pull it once, and if you don't pull it, it defaults to All Star. You cannot kill yourself. So, uh, <laughs> the Sisyphus trolley problem. So you have to just keep pulling the lever over and over again to save the five people's lives and things like that. So um, there is a... <laughs> there are all sorts of quite quite hilarious trolley problem memes and I encourage you to, to look to look into it. It's, it's quite funny. Um, I did a field trip to Stanford uh, about four or five years ago and uh, I asked the, uh, we went to the Autonomous um, Car Research Center at Stanford, where they're developing autonomous car, like the race cars and stuff like that. It's really cool. And I, I put up my hand, I said, what is your solution to the trolley problem? And he's like, here's how we solve the trolley problem. We take a bunch of college freshmen and we put them into a driving simulation and then put them into a trolley problem scenario. The brakes aren't working. You know, you're going to either run over, you know, this person or that person or whatever. And then we just program our computer to do whatever the freshmen do. So basically sort of outsourcing your ethics, right? So you just have people driving and then you just throw them into these unwinnable scenarios and just see how they behave. And then we, we just program the computer that way. Then it's not our fault that our car ran over five people. It's the college freshman we can plan. So, <laughs> what do you th what do you think of that solution? I thought it was pretty interesting, at least. Did they actually die though? No, it's it's a simulation. Like they have they, they actually have a pretty cool driving simulation there, and uh, like it's a full screen thing. Like you have a car, and, and so they actually just have freshmen come in and just drive the car, and then they throw people jump out in front of them and stuff like that. Um, and then they just you know take the aggregate response and say, okay, you know, we're going to make our autonomous vehicles drive like college freshmen. <laughs> yeah. Like I remember how my friends drove when I was a freshman. I don't want autonomous vehicles driving that way. Like we're doing like 80 on the campus loop. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> okay. So, they make poor, yeah, I, I know. I'm just like, yeah, college freshmen don't seem like the best people you should be, uh, you know, using for this for this calculus, you know. So, uh, all right, so that is, uh, uh, so yeah, so autonomous vehicles, is a big, it's a big, um, 
big question right now, right? Because it's they're they're going to become more and more common in the upcoming years, and at some point there's going to be an ethical question as to who it should kill, right? It's going to happen. It has happened. You know, autonomous vehicles have run over people. You know, they're pretty safe, but you know, if somebody jumps out in front of you, you physics are physics. You know, so uh, <laughs> trolling problem version 2020. If you can only watch. Yeah, so if, if you haven't seen the, uh, I'm, I'm not going to play it because I'll get copyright stri stricken, but uh, the good place uh, trolley problem is a uh, uh, pretty good episode. So they're they're actually on a trolley and, yeah, so create the bubble shield from Halo. Yeah. All right, so that is our class for today. Uh, I'll, I'll stream this after, after the recording's done if you... Uh, are watching a recording of this, I encourage you to go onto YouTube and watch it. It's a couple minutes long. It's from from the blood on uh, Chidi's uh, shirt. You can probably guess how it, how it worked out. Okay. I'll see you all on Friday, and we will do more scratch programming. All right. See you all.